Yo, everybody. Happy All Hallows Eve Eve. So, today we're going to be doing this a little differently. Alice is actually traveling, so it's just me. So, well, my intention is to kind of go through what happened today, but also answer your questions. So, I'll be paying a lot of attention to what's being said in the chat. So, if you guys have questions, go ahead and answer. But, essentially, I'm just going to go through it, explain some of the legal things. Um, for those of you who don't know, who, who don't understand what a writ of mandamus is. <laughs> uh, you know, this case, man, it's like a law school class. It just gets more and more interesting as we go along. Something new every day. You don't see writs of mandamus that often. Um, you know, I've done a lot of things uh, over my time in, in the law. I've never had to respond to a writ of mandamus. This is a new thing. So I had to reach out to some people and get educated on them. But there's a few things to note here. So... For those of you who, who don't know, I know some of you, you come into this and you're like shocked. Like, what in the world's going on? What now? What now? So essentially, you have the Delphi case. Richard Allen's attorneys have been removed, removed themselves, depending on who you, who you talk to. They obviously are very upset about that. They want to be back in the case. They filed a bunch of stuff. It keeps getting struck. Uh, lots of different things are going on. Typically, you can't really do anything about what's going on in a case unless you file an appeal. And the problem with appeals is usually you have to have a final order or a final judgment to appeal from. So imagine, for instance, it goes to trial, you lose your case, you're convicted, then you can appeal. You can appeal anything you want, basically, at that point. But the problem with that is you have to go all the way through trial before you can do anything about the things that are happening to you. So a lot of times you'll want to, you want to appeal before that because you don't want to be stuck to whatever's happening to you. And when you do that, it's called an interlocutory appeal. But the problem is courts generally only allow you to have interlocutory appeals in very narrow circumstances. So what you end up doing is in state court in particular, in federal court, I've worked for both a state AG's office and the federal government. So in federal court, they're almost never writs of mandamus. They almost never happen. I mean, they do happen. They tend to be frivolous. They tend to be filed by pro se litigants. It's just not something that happens much at all, right? So that's, that's how that goes. But in state court... State court mandamus can be something that is used a lot. And it really just depends per state. And essentially what it is, is it's a filing that asks a higher court to tell a lower court, you have to do this thing, right? So we're the Supreme Court and this party has come to us and they've said, this lower court, they are doing something crazy. You need to do this thing. Now, because of that, it's very limited. We call it an extraordinary writ, and it's extraordinary for a reason. They're rarely granted, and you have to show really high, a really high burden to get there. So when you look at this writ of mandamus, there's a couple things you might have noticed about it. Number one, it does not ask for these attorneys to be reinstated. The relief it seeks is actually pretty limited. It basically says, look, number one, we want the docket to be full. We want to be able to see the whole docket. We want the documents to be public. We want the documents that were struck to be on there. That's essentially all it asks. And the reason for that is when you file a writ of mandamus, the first thing you have to show is a clear right. You have to show that you're absolutely entitled to the thing. So it has to be really straightforward. And you have to show that unless you get this immediate relief, you're never going to get relief. This isn't something that can be dealt with in an appeal later on. The fact of the matter is being having an attorney removed from a case gets dealt with in appeals all the time. It's probably not something you can actually use mandamus for. But something like this, you know, the fact that it's being conducted in secrecy, the fact that these documents aren't on the docket, these are things that if they're not dealt with now, there's there's a real harm happening right now. And if the law is clear, then it's something that you could get a Supreme Court to actually say, yeah, we're going to grant that. A couple things about it. Number one, the lawyers who did it are these sort of new lawyers, new attorneys. So they're not the attorneys who were appointed. They're not the old attorneys. Not really sure where they came from. Not sure if they're doing this for free. Not sure if they're being paid. They did a really good job, I thought. 
Frankly, I thought I thought this writ of mandamus was one of the better written things that we've seen from the defense side in this case. And it was really clever, too, because the relief is limited. And frankly, it's kind of relief that everybody wants. I mean, this is one that you read it and you're like, yeah, personally, I would really like it if maybe the Supreme Court granted this. As we've said from the very beginning, the fact that this case has been like cloaked in secrecy has been a problem. And it's been a problem throughout the case. I think it's led to a lot of conspiracy theories. I think it's led to a lot of misleading information in the public. And we can actually see that. And I'm going to talk about it in a second. Somebody asked why, what a relator is. A relator is essentially a plaintiff. It's the person on behalf this is being done. So these attorneys are doing this on behalf of relator Richard Allen. And you kind of need somebody who has an interest in the case. And obviously, he has an interest in the case. So they're asking for very narrow relief. It's relief I think most people support. It's relief, frankly, I, I wish they would grant. Why are they doing it? I think that's a little bit more complicated of a question. Because, you know, in the grand scheme of things, unless you just think they're just being, you know, they, they just love the public so much. And they really want the public. And they believe in transparency. And, and maybe that's what it is. Um, but if you don't think that, you got to think there's some sort of end game that's harder to say. I think, and this is me being a little conspiratorial, I know, but I think what they want, I think there is a little bit of a concerted effort to essentially, I mean, I don't think this is that conspiratorial, to discredit the judge. I think there is a, a bit of a smear campaign going on. I think it's a, I think it's coordinated. I think it's pretty well organized. I think you saw this was filed today at the same time this was filed. filed. You kind of had an opposition information dump, right? So you had people start pushing out opinions of the judges where the judge got reversed. There was one case that where the judge got reversed the case. I think it was like an eight year old girl. Her father sexually assaulted her. The judge went too far with a protective order. Didn't allow the defense to see a certain document. I think it was a statement of the child and the Supreme court of Indiana said, no, you can't do that. That went too far. I understand what you're trying to do, but the, the defendant gets to see that document. Okay. Yeah, she got that one wrong. Um, you kind of see where her heart was in that. And I think people are saying, look, she's she's biased against defendants who hurt kids, right? And that that's a reason she needs to be removed from this case. The thing about it, just because she's removed doesn't mean these other attorneys are going to be able to come back, but I guess they figure we better shot against a new judge than this judge. Interesting thing about the mandamus, it's a sideline. So some mandamus can result in a stay. If you're mandamusing something that's critical to the case, you know, maybe like a venue change or something like that. You might have a situation where you really need to stay the case so that the Supreme Court can make a decision. So the Supreme Court can say, hey, do the thing, you move the case or whatever, and then move forward. This, I think, will basically just, it will continue with the case. Like there's no reason, for instance, to cancel the hearing tomorrow. In my view, this mandamus is really just about the docket. You're either going to restore some filings or not. What I would expect to happen if they restore the filings, that'll be used as a data point that the judge is biased and the judge is not doing a good job with the case. And how do we know that? Because the Supreme Court of Indiana had to step in and mandamus her. And a mandamus is just a command. It's a command from the, from the higher court to do something. And that's what they're seeking. Like I said, it's an extraordinary thing. They call it an extraordinary writ for a reason. They cite a lot of case law or they cite a lot of statutes for open records and everything else in Indiana. Not an Indiana lawyer, worked all day, didn't have a lot of time to dive into Indiana law and figure out whether or not this particular question is something that has been dealt with. It seems like Indiana is kind of secretive. And when we're talking to like the murder sheet, for instance, they talk about how Indiana tends to be kind of secretive. So I'll be a little surprised if they're right about, you know, this is this is extraordinary the way she's keeping all this stuff secret. I wish she wouldn't. So I'm kind of, I don't know, I'm, I'm divided on it. Because on the one hand, I think they're probably right. I think this stuff needs to be public. But on the other hand, it does seem like it's kind of underhanded. Sort of an underhanded way to sort of strike at the judge's credibility. So that's the first thing. Now, the second thing about it, and one of the reasons I think they're actually right, and I think this would be good, Alice and I, we got to talk to a group of law enforcement 
about a thousand members of law enforcement last week. And we actually used this case as an example of why secrecy is bad. <laughs> so we talked about how we get it, like we talked about on the show, hold back evidence, really important, totally get why you want to hold back things, totally get why you don't want these cases to be tried in the public. But by holding back all this information, you get a lot of conspiracies. And look, if the removal of these lawyers isn't the perfect example of that, I don't know what is. So, you have a situation where, you know, the lawyers for Richard Allen, in particular Rosie, though I think Baldwin's skulking around the background somewhere. Somebody said he he wants to do do this case pro se. Okay. Um, number one, I think he would bankrupt himself if he did that. But number two, this is not this is not about that. So they are claiming, you know, they were ambushed. They walked into that hearing. They might have had some general idea of what was coming, and that's why they hired a lawyer and filed a memorandum. It's not the kind of thing you typically do on the basis of a guess, but they were ambushed. They were shocked. The judge just really came after them and, and hammered them for this leak and said, if you don't withdraw, I'm going to withdraw you. And, and they really present this in their filings as if they had no idea this was coming. But interestingly, <laughs> with the release of these documents today, it kind of looks like that's just completely false. I'm not really sure what they mean by that. I have speculated that when they say ambush, they really just mean the evidence of their involvement in the leak was was much greater than they expected. And that's what they mean by an ambush. But I just want to go through some of the documents in here to point out the timeline, because these are all things that should have been public. I think the judge made a huge mistake when she did not have a hearing on the record to do this. We've, we've not missed words about this. We think this was the kind of breach that removing an attorney is an appropriate action. Um, but it's a serious one. It's a big deal. It's a big deal when you take someone's lawyers away, even when they're court appointed, which, you know, when they're a court appointed attorney, it's kind of interesting. One of the few places where money matters in the law. If you hire your own attorney, it's actually harder for the court to remove them than if they're court appointed. If you hire, and you can sort of imagine why this is. You have $50,000 to hire a lawyer. You go find one, you pick them, you give them the money. You know, to remove that attorney, all of a sudden you're now out the money. Now you got to go hire somebody else. Maybe you can't afford to hire somebody else. You know, it's it's kind of a bigger deal. But the courts have basically said when you're appointed an attorney, you don't really have that many rights. Number one, you don't have a right to choose your own attorney. And you really don't have much of a right to retain them. And they can be removed for a lot of reasons. And continuity of counsel is something that the courts just really haven't put a lot of stock into when it comes to appointed counsel. And we can talk about those cases later. I think they're cases that would surprise people. I think most people would be kind of surprised at how little of a right you have in your appointed counsel and that person continuing to be your counsel. And the Supreme Court has said, even with retained counsel, the court inherently retains the ability to ensure sort of an ethical representation, to ensure there's no conflict. And I think that's really what the judge is relying on here is that inherent power to remove these attorneys. Before we get into sort of the details, one you know, some of the things people have talked about, you know, they go, they, they have this hearing in chambers and the attorneys essentially say, Baldwin orally withdraws. Rosie says, I'll file something in writing later. And people have pointed to rules about this that apply to lawyers that say things like, if you're going to withdraw from a case, you know, you need to file something to get 14 days notice. I think it's 14 days, something like that. And that's how you do it. And people are like, well, you know, could you do it this way? Well, first of all, this is a judge essentially removing lawyers. It's not a lawyer deciding like, I just can't do this case or I can't afford this case or I've got some sort of conflict or I have you know, this reason or that reason. And that's really, we want to ensure that when lawyers withdraw, if a lawyer takes a case, or if a lawyer is placed on a case, we talked about this a little bit on the show before, it's a big deal. And they can't just decide they don't want to do it. You know, people have asked us before, if, if they put you on a case where you really don't like the defendant, or where you really think you're going to lose, could you just withdraw? Well, no, is the answer. You have to file something in writing and you have to give your reason. But let's imagine that because of the way, the way the way the judge did this, which I think was a mistake, she ever did it this way. I think she granted some grace to these attorneys and said, hey, I'll let you withdraw. And, and Rosie was going to file something in writing. And he never did. Is that like a gotcha? 
Is it a gotcha? Does that mean the judge can't remove them? Well, number one, there aren't many gotchas in the law. Number two, there are all these sort of retroactive things you can do in the law. They have fancy Latin names that I'm not going to go through, but the judge can essentially hold you to what you said. She can file something that essentially goes back in time and makes something happen. The other thing is something called invited error. So if, for instance, it was error to allow these attorneys out of the case or to remove these attorneys from the case without them filing something, the fact that they are the ones who made that happen, they're the ones who said, no need for a hearing, we'll take care of this, means that later on when they want to claim error, you can argue, hey, look, you invited this. You stepped into it. You see this sometimes with jury instructions where you have an opportunity to object to a jury instruction. And the judge will ask you, is this, is this instruction okay? And if you're an attorney and you, and you know that actually that's an illegal jury instruction, you can't just say, oh yeah, that's fine, judge. And then they give the instruction and then later on you say, oh, the, the court misinformed the jury. The courts will say, no, you invited that error. You can't complain about it now. So I think that's a, one of the things, just a little sort of weirdness that's going on in this case. But let's, let's talk about some of these documents because I think the timeline's important. It always is. So this all began because of this leak of photographs. Now we know that the attorneys were removed on October 19th. That's when all this went down. That's when the ambush happened. So the interesting thing that, you know, it always blows my mind, the difference between federal court and state court. Like I said, I've been in both. Federal court is so structured. It is so formal. So everything about federal court is, you know, you, you file everything, you know, you don't call the chambers by yourself. you everything is formal. It's very structured, a lot more written stuff, a lot less stuff on the, on the fly, far fewer oral motions. You just don't do that. State court's like the wild west. <laughs> and it really just depends on where you're practicing. And some state court judges are just very sort of loosey-goosey. I don't know how loosey-goosey this judge is, but one thing that I thought was interesting is that the judge and the lawyers are just emailing with each other. Like, I can't, I really can't imagine sending an email to a judge I practice in front of. Like, the whole, the whole notion of that is just, just blows my mind. But that's what's happening here. They're just sending emails back and forth. So what happened is on October 6th, 6th, so 13 days before they'll be removed from this case, it's actually Rosie that sends an email to the court informing them that this is going on, that this leak has occurred. And I actually think it's interesting. I kind of think Rosie at the time thought it was the prosecution who did this. I actually think Rosie is probably less in the know than the other one. I think the other one might have known a little bit more what's going on, but I think Rosie was kind of in the dark. And Rosie, he sends this email and it says, I'm going to read you the whole thing. This is October 6th at 413. Good afternoon, Judge. Andy and I wanted to touch base with you before the end of the work week. And it's Andrew Baldwin, Andy. See, they're just all good friends, right? <laughs> the issue revolves around the possibility that some of the crime scene photos have been leaked, so to speak, and are in the hands of the public. There is most certainly a photo of the F tree that is floating around in public. The photo itself is not overly disturbing, but the concept that it is in the hands of the public is of concern. So they obviously recognize at this point the fact that these photos are out there matter. Of greater concern is the fact that a local content creator by the name of Rick Snay, and I have no idea who that is, has apparently communicated to the public that he has copies of the crime scene photos. I'm attaching a copy of the communication that was forwarded to one of our staff members by an uninvolved third party. We just learned of this in the last hour. I immediately called Nick and informed him of the circumstances. Turns out Nick has known about this for the past 24 to 30 hours or so. And I think that's an indication that he thinks the prosecution thinks they had the leak and they were trying to keep it quiet. I think when he says that, like, oh, they've known about it for 24 hours and they didn't say anything. What really was happening is the prosecution is investigating this this whole thing. But I really think just from reading that, that that's what he thought happened. And he was he was kind of preparing himself to have a weapon against the prosecution. He informed me that they are looking into this matter. The primary purpose of this email is to communicate our concerns with the situation. We most certainly did not leak this information. 
We wanted to make sure we got out ahead of this and inform the court as well as Nick in the event these pictures found their way on the internet. This might be a circumstance which requires the court's attention. I say that in terms of conducting some inquiry into the source of this information leak. Otherwise, Andy and I are both available for a phone call if necessary. Nick informed me earlier that he too is available for a phone call throughout the weekend if necessary. We await your response. So that's the, the defense's initial position on this is big deal. Not sure how this happened. Court may have to look into it. We're ready to have a phone call over the weekend. That's the way they're going to go. So that's October 6th. Once again, everybody's just good friends here. This this email is really interesting. There's a lot to, to mention about it. This is from Judge Gull. And, and the other thing about this, just as an aside, so they file this mandamus, and it's all about getting all these documents made public. And then they file something that just has all the documents they want to make public in it. These emails include like the judge's email address. They include the cell phone number of the prosecutor and nobody bothered to redact any of this. And this just goes to this continuing apparent lack of any concern anyone has here for privacy or redactions or any of the things that you would normally do in a case. But that's, that's my, that's my soapbox. Okay. So October 8th, 2023. This is a Sunday at 11 o'clock a.m. This is from Judge Cole. Good morning, gentlemen. Thank you for passing this troubling information along to me. I am quite disturbed by this new development. Since Nick has been made aware of this information, I am making some assumptions that I would like a response to. Now, remember, at this point, Judge Cole has no reason to think that the defense did this. You know, maybe she's taken from the defense's email to think maybe this is a police officer or the prosecution that did this. She's already upset about it. This is not something where she doesn't get upset until she finds out that those dastardly defense attorneys who she doesn't like did something about this. Okay. <clears throat> Here are her the, the questions she would like a response to. One, I assume that law enforcement is investigating. Two, I assume the local content creator, Rick Snay, has been interviewed. Three, I assume the individuals named Anya, Anya and Kevin have been interviewed. This goes back to the fact that Murder Sheet were some of the first people to receive these photographs and in fact reached out to both the prosecution and the defense to let them know that this leak had happened. The judge is unhappy that anyone has this, as you're going to see. I assume law enforcement has demanded the return of the photographs and the possession of Rick Snay, Anya, and Kevin. I assume that Brad and Andy have provided the name of their staff member and the uninvolved third party to Nick for interview by law enforcement. I recall our communication back in December 2022 regarding an email from Andy to Brad, which contained discovery information, but was sent to the wrong Brad in Andy's address, address book. Has that individual been interviewed? Could that be the source of the leak? If you're not aware of this, this is the first leak. So the first leak, essentially, Rosie was trying to send discovery information to his co-counsel. But when he typed in the address into his email, another Brad, who was a guy I think he just represented, pops up. He doesn't notice, and he ends up sending it off to that guy. The information that was sent out was not as bad. <laughs> it wasn't as... as compromising is the information that got out this time. But nevertheless, it was a leak, and apparently it was a leak that the court was made aware of. And this is another important thing. As I've said, the problem with this case is there's no transparency. It's one thing the Mendema's petition actually goes after. And because of that, a lot of times we talk about this case as if the parties are never talking, as if they have the same information we do. And that's never been true. And we knew that wasn't true. We knew that the parties in the court were talking. We knew they were sharing information. Just until this, we didn't know how much. So, for instance, when that hearing is supposed to happen and they walk in and they get ambushed, we knew they had some amount of heads up about what this was about. But we just didn't know how much of it was official and how much of it was they had just heard through the grapevine that the judge was angry. This is confirming that there's been a lot of official discussion back and forth about leaks, not just this leak, but earlier leaks as well. Okay. I also recall, I also recall a bill I received from Brad and Andy for duplication of exhibits by a vendor, which I disallowed. Is it possible that vendor is involved? Brad and Andy should share the name of that vendor and the date that vendor was hired to Nick and her law enforcement for investigation as a possible source of the leak. So she's thinking through all the possibilities. Could it be this other Brad who got information? 
Could it be somebody who, who made copies for the defense that kept a copy for themselves and then leaked it? These local content creators are not journalists and have no right to claim any type of privilege. Okay, judge is completely wrong there. <laughs> this is an absolutely incorrect statement of the law. They are journalists. Journalists, there's no, you don't have to have a license to be a journalist. If you're somebody who, who talks about current events, you're a journalist as far as the Constitution is concerned. So she's wrong about that. They should divulge to law enforcement who they got these photographs from to allow law enforcement to continue to investigate. Also, another interesting sort of privilege issue. You guys may recall, there are times where journalists actually go to jail to avoid having to disclose their source. The Supreme Court has said that while you have a privilege to publish information that maybe the government doesn't want you to publish, you do not have a privilege and who your source is. So journalists will sometimes... I actually had a journalist tell me once they were asking me for some information, which I would not give them to, I would not give to them. And she literally said to me, I would go to jail for you. I was like, okay, sure you would, but they will. And they do on occasion. So they continue. The photographs must be returned to law enforcement. If they refuse to turn them over voluntarily, I will issue an order directing the immediate return where they will be subject to contempt of court. That contempt will result in an immediate arrest and incarceration until such time as the photographs are returned. This is a drastic measure I should not have to take, but will if necessary. Another fascinating constitutional question about whether or not she can do that, but that's not why we're here tonight. Each of you have numerous staff and assistants helping you with your work. I'm also assuming that you, you all trust those individuals to maintain the integrity of the case and that you're confident none of these individuals are involved. Please let me know at your earliest convenience what your thoughts are about moving forward. So she's very concerned about this leak. She wants to know where it came from. And she wants the parties essentially to come together and tell her what should we do to move forward. Okay. So that was on October 8th. So the investigation continues and, and Nicholas McClelland, who's a Nick and all these emails, he starts getting more information. On October 12th at 4.07 a.m., this is a Thursday, October 12th, he sends an email to Judge Gold. This is from Nick McClelland, who is the prosecutor, Brad Rosie, and Andy Baldwin. Baldwin, subject is urgent. I'm going to leave some stuff out of this, but I'll read you most of it. Judge and gentlemen, it is currently 3.53 a.m., and I just got off the phone with ISP. From the phone conference that the four of us had on Tuesday afternoon, October the 10th, which that's something else we didn't know about. So they had a telephone conference where they discuss this leak. Just more evidence that this is an ongoing conversation between these parties. And it was on October the 10th when, as the email continues, Andy Baldwin informed us that Mitch Westerman went into his conference room sometime in August and took pictures of evidence in this case and then leaked or forwarded those pictures to an individual by the name of, I won't say his name, everybody knows what his name is by this point, but I'm just not going to say it. This person then leaked or forwarded them on down the chain and eventually it was made public that the documents were leaked. This person lives in Fishers, Indiana and is employed as a civilian at a military base. It goes on to sort of discuss him and at some point ISP detectives went to where he worked and interviewed him. And the goal, as it says, was to gather the photos that he had and make sure they were deleted from his phone and to find out who gave him the photos and who he gave the photos to. He met with the detectives but refused to answer any questions and stated that he wanted an attorney. Soon after that, we had our phone conference between the four of us. So they're having a phone conference on this day, on the 10th. And then it goes through how he did that. Um, the last info that we have is that he told his wife that he should just be honest or come clean about where I got the photos and it will be okay. I'm not sure if this is the appropriate way to notify everyone of this, but it is 4 a.m. and this is the latest and bizarre twist in this case. This is getting serious and way out of control, gentlemen. If you have additional information about this leak, please forward it on to me or ISP Detective Holman immediately. I do not want to get um, I do not want to get another phone call like this that someone else involved in the leak has hurt themselves or someone else. I am up if anyone needs to call. He then puts his cell phone number in there, which nobody bothers to redact. Thank you, and I apologize about the email. Now, one thing that's interesting about this, this email is sent on October 12th. It references a telephone call on October 10th. On October 11th, there was a note sent 
to Judge Goal. Let's see if I can pull it up. And this note is from Richard Allen. Okay, there it is. So on October 11th, Richard Allen writes a letter to Judge Goal. This is after this telephone call that they've had with the judge, the prosecutors, and the defense attorneys on October 10th. And here's what he says. Dear Judge Goal, please accept this letter as confirmation that I have communicated with my attorney. By the way, there's no way he wrote this. With my attorney, Bradley A. Rosie, regarding the circumstances regarding the leak of sensitive information in this case. I'm aware that images of crime scene photos and other related documents were taken by a friend and former employee of Attorney Baldwin at Attorney Baldwin's office. I have discussed with Attorney Rosie the potential impact that the distribution of these documents could have on my defense. Attorney Rosie has also communicated to me that the prosecutor has requested that my attorneys be disqualified from representing me in this case. So let's just stop right there. So on October 10th, during the telephone call between the defense attorneys and the prosecutor, the prosecutor requests that the defense attorneys be removed from the case. And he requests that because there's been a leak in the case. That's on October 10th. They're not removed until October 19th. The defense attorneys have filed multiple filings at this point saying that they were ambushed, that when they walked into that hearing on October 19th, how could they know what was going to happen? But it appears that as early as October 10th, the prosecution had already told the judge you need to remove these people such that they then went to their client and said, Hey, we need a letter from you. We need a letter from you that will help us stay in the case. He goes on to say, I do not want this to happen. I want Mr. Baldwin and Mr. Rosie to continue to represent me until this case is resolved one way or the other. I believe they're acting in a manner that is in my best interest. I appreciate your time and consideration in this matter. You know, I mean, I guess you could argue that he's waiving a conflict here because the leak of the photos could present a conflict. These attorneys now have their own interest in this case. They have their own interest to defend, to prove that they weren't involved. You would have to waive a conflict if you're, you know, if you're the client and there's a conflict and you want your attorney to continue, you have to waive it because that is what they would say is happening here. I will say Supreme Court has said when you have a conflict, even if you have a waiver from the client, there are situations in which the judge can say, look, it's just too serious for the good of the case. I'm going to remove you. That's the first thing. The second thing, the leak of the photos. I mean, I get that Richard Allen, it, he doesn't he's saying in this letter that he doesn't care, but the impact is not really on him. The other thing is all of this stuff, the emails, the letter from Richard Allen, it all talks about the photos. There were more leaks than that. We know that. The photos are the most egregious, and they're the thing people talk about the most. But as we've said before, there's also evidence that there was defense strategy leaked, that there were plans leaked, that various other information was being leaked. And, and this is another reason I wish the judge had went ahead and had that hearing, because I think there's something a lot more going on here. I think this this argument that this was a one-time thing, I don't know that it holds up. And I've seen that filed multiple times on official court filings, which is troubling to me <laughs> that, that people would be saying on the record, this is what happened if that's not what happened. But I mean, that seems to be something that's happening more and more. The whole ambush thing appears to be completely false. If you have Richard Allen writing this on October 11th and they're not removed until October 19th, that seems like a lot of notice to me. That seems like a lot of time to prepare a response to the request that's being made of you. So I find that date to be very interesting. Going back to this email exchange. So on o October 12th, so Richard Allen sends that on October 11th. October 12th, Nick McClelland writes an email informing the judge of this suicide, which apparently appears to be somewhat related to this. I mean, as I've said, and will continue to say, you can never know what someone's going through and you can never know what they're thinking, but it's a, it's a pretty significant coincidence. At this point, Judge Gull responds. And she says, gentlemen, this is beyond tragic. Once again, I'm at a loss for words. I am deeply concerned that Mr. Allen's defense is being compromised by all these recent events. I will have my staff schedule a hearing in Fort Wayne for next Thursday, October 19th at 2 p.m., to discuss these recent developments in the upcoming hearing on October 31st. 
I'll have a transport order prepared to get Mr. Allen to the hearing. Please arrange your schedules accordingly to appear in Allen Superior Court. Mr. Rosie and Mr. Baldwin, please cease work on Mr. Allen's case until we meet on the 19th. So essentially, after the telephone call, the note from Allen, the suicide, this email, the judge is saying, stop work. We're going to have a hearing. We're going to get to the bottom of this. It's not surprising that after this, Baldwin hires an attorney and puts together a filing opposing this notion that the prosecution, this motion, essentially the prosecution has now made to remove him from the case. They go forward, they have the hearing, they go back into chambers. I think the judge by that point had done a lot of research and had some time to do it. And I think essentially the rest of it is true. I think the judge said, look, I've looked at this. I think this is catastrophic. I'm going, we're going to have this hearing and you're going to be removed or you can withdraw now. I think that was a mistake by the judge. I think, you know, the judge kind of reminds me of Ned Stark. I don't know if you guys watch Game of Thrones or not, but Ned Stark in the first season, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen it, there is a point where instead of just doing what he should do, he goes to Cersei and he says, look, this is what I'm going to do. And I'm giving you this opportunity to save yourself and save your children. And so, of course, instead, she has him arrested and eventually he gets his head cut off. Right. And I feel like Judge Gull fell into that same trap rather than just having the hearing, putting this all out there, getting it all on the record, making a record, having people testify, explaining this timeline, going through when everybody knew everything. Instead, she has this before the hearing meeting. She tells him exactly what she's going to do. They withdraw. And then one day later, they're filing stuff, seeking her to be recused and, you know, everything else in the world. So huge mistake on her part. Probably the biggest mistake she's made. Hopefully she will go forward and be more transparent. Personally, I wish she would write an opinion. I wish she would write something, a memorandum, laying out exactly what happened, exactly what the evidence was, exactly what the timeline was. I wish she would do all that. I wish she would release a transcript of the behind of the in chambers conference. I think she should do all those things. I'd be fine. Like I said, Supreme court can grant this mandamus, make these things public. That's how this should be done anyway. And if these things had been done in the public, I think a lot of the speculation and these sort of conspiracy theories that we've seen over the last week or so, we wouldn't have. And you certainly wouldn't have the defense being able to say they were ambushed when in fact nine days Before they were removed, they were on a conference call where the prosecution says they should be removed because of their their gross negligence that led to the release of this document. So that is my take on all this. (laughs) Do you have questions? Do all of you out there have questions about things you want to know about? I've tried to sort of cover the whole thing in, in big swaths, but... You know, when it's just me and I'm just talking endlessly, it's harder for me to follow the chat (laughs) because I don't have Alice to offer her brilliance and her insights into all this stuff. Sorry to be dense. So the new lawyers went to the Supreme Court. Yes, a mandamus is something you file in a higher court asking them to tell a lower court to do something, basically a follow the law order. It's basically like, look, you did this thing. The law says you have to do X. You did Y. Go back and do X. It's very narrow. It's sort of outside the case. Like Richard Allen's case is not in the Supreme Court right now. Okay. This is like a third party action. Richard Allen is the relator. He is the person who, who files it, you know, and and he's asking for this thing to happen. And then if the thing happens, then the mandamus action just goes away. The documents become public. The documents that were struck will be back on the on the docket, though that doesn't mean they'll be active documents. That's sort of another thing. Like the documents, like she, it's, it seems like the judge not only struck the documents and said like these are improperly filed. I'm not even going to consider these. She also removed them from the docket. Essentially, like if I tried to file something, like if I sent a filing today to be filed in the Richard Allen case, that's not going to become part of the record because I am not an attorney on the case. And I think she sort of just took that step and just removed them. And they're saying, look, fine if you want to strike them, but you should leave them on there. I think for sort of a future appeal, when we appeal and say, oh, you never should have removed us. You abused your discretion. We want these documents on there. So like they're on the the docket or whatnot. I think that's sort of what they're saying. It is a very low level thing. Like what they're asking is, when I saw it, I thought it was going to be 
you know, recuse Judge Gold tomorrow and reinstate the lawyers, which I thought would have been crazy because normally you can't do that in mandamus, but they didn't. They kept it very responsible. I think what they filed is a pretty good filing. So, you know, I think, you know, it may very well work. The pro bono filings, I mean, look, the purpose, she did not remove the attorneys, you know, because Richard Allen couldn't afford them or because or to save the state money. She removed them because they had violated their ethical obligations to the court and to their client. And that is an inherent power of the court. The Supreme Court has recognized it on multiple occasions. So I don't think you can just come back and say, well, I know the reason you removed us had nothing to do with money, but now we're willing to do it for free. Plus, I don't know that they could. I mean, they, they are filing that because they know it'll be denied. <laughs> That's one of those things where the worst thing for them would be if it was granted. Because then they'd be like, oh, no. Now we have to try this. Now we have to spend a year trying this case for free. <laughs> like, how are we going to afford that? Right? So they filed it knowing it'll be denied. And then it's, presumably that'll be something else they can appeal. As I said before, appointed attorneys, you just have a lot fewer rights when your attorney is appointed versus when it's an attorney of your choice. So I think that if they did that, then I think that's sort of a, a trick they're trying to do, but I don't know how it will work out. Will they show up tomorrow for the hearing? I mean, who knows? Who knows? They may show up and try and sit at council table <laughs> and then she can have them. She can have them arrested and then it'll be even crazier. And that's what's wild about this. If you think about it, like the prosecution's just over there. Like, can we try a case? Can we just, can we just go to trial? Like we're ready for trial. Like they're not doing anything. People talk about sort of the case being in shambles or the case is chaos. It's really just the defense side of the case. It's chaos. Like the prosecutions, nothing has happened to them. They're just perfectly ready to go. They just need the defense side to get sort of straightened out so they can move forward. You know, I mean, I think at this point I would take a compromise position where the, the two attorneys leave and the judge recuses too. Like if we wanted to like, Split the baby, Solomon style. I guess Solomon didn't split the baby. But if you wanted to split the baby, get rid of all of them. Just start over. I think the prosecution will be fine with that at this point. They are just ready to go forward. And who knows if that's ever actually going to happen. I think, the prosecution, or I think the hearing's in the morning tomorrow. I talked to Bob. Bob's heading down there for it. I think he's headed down right now, even as we speak. So he's supposed to, I'll be doing Halloween all day tomorrow, so I won't pay any attention and you will not see me tomorrow night. But he's going to give me the the uh, the heads up on what happened and presumably we'll do some some live on it as well. So probably a little bit more pro defense than, than what we do. Just, you know, nothing to point out. Like, I see this all the time. I don't know if it's just because this is the way it is on the internet these days. Like, if you disagree with somebody at all, you must hate them. Like, Bob and I argue about this case all the time. And people are like, oh, no, they don't like each other anymore. That's we're lawyers. <laughs> That's what we do for a living, guys. Eventually, we're going to do eventually when this stuff calms down. And it's not just reacting to to this. We'll get together again and talk some more about these cases. But I mean, Anna Mills apparently asked such a good question, but I don't know what her question was. So <laughs> uh, let's see. Oh, what happened to Richard Allen's mental decline? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, the letter he wrote to the judge was pretty pretty coherent but who knows okay the random attorneys well they have standing because they represent richard allen who has standing richard allen has standing to file a mandamus to have the law followed in his case so i don't know where they came from i don't know if at this point there's some sort of like defense fund for richard allen i mean obviously over the last six months or so the public opinion of richard allen has improved there are people now who no longer think he's guilty. There are people who think he is an innocent man being railroaded by both a conspiracy, by biased judge, by corrupt prosecution, by the police who are all Odinist. I mean, people feel very strongly about this. So it wouldn't shock me if actually he does have some money at this point. Or it could just be pro bono because these attorneys think, hey, we don't like the way the judge is doing this. We don't like the fact that she's keeping everything secret. I don't like the fact she's keeping everything secret. These are not the newly appointed attorneys. The newly appointed attorneys represent him in the criminal case. Who knows how they feel about this? One weird thing about this is you've got a situation where the old lawyers are fighting to stay on the case and want Richard Allen to want them. And he said he wants them. 
and presumably will say he doesn't want these lawyers. Now, as I've said, when you have appointed counsel, you do not get to choose. Ordinarily, judges will give you one off. So if you get appointed a lawyer and you really don't like them, the judge will give you a new lawyer. And you get a new lawyer. And if you really don't like that lawyer, some judges will give you another one. But a lot of them will say, look, you got two choices. You got three choices. You can keep your current attorney. You can hire one, which usually the reason you have an appointed attorney is because you can't afford them, or you can go pro se. Those are your options. And courts have upheld that again and again. So if Richard Allen doesn't want these current attorneys, the judge can say tough. Obviously not a great place to be in, given this whole situation that's developing. Now, what is interesting, I assume the lawyers who were filing the mandamus for him are only doing the mandamus. I don't think they are going to get into this sort of, they're willing to do something that'll be decided by the middle of November. I don't know that they're willing to do something that's going to be lasting for another year. And I don't know that they are criminal defense attorneys. I think they're appellate lawyers. So that's why you would see them filing something in the Supreme Court and not necessarily his trial attorneys. Appellate law is very different from trial law, as we've talked about before. Discovery is going to work with his new lawyers. Um, so this is this is a great question, Julie, and it really depends. Typically, the old lawyers are supposed to give the new lawyers all their discovery that's been provided to them. My practice has always been, if there's a new lawyer, to provide new discovery because I don't want to trust that the old lawyer did it, they didn't do it, or they didn't do all of it, and then something's missing, and then we have to litigate did you really turn it over? Did you not turn it over? And, and, I mean, just all that mess. So I think what the prosecution will probably do is they will work with the new attorneys to, to, you know, get them a fresh set of discovery and just start fresh. But we'll just have to see how that goes. Certainly the other thing you're seeing, I mean, look, this case is as close to a political campaign as I've ever seen. You know, I've worked on political campaigns. I've been a communicator in politics. I wouldn't recommend it. But what you see here is something we call opposition research. And opposition research, the way you do it is you research a bunch of stuff about people and then you selectively release it to your friends and then they amplify it for you so it doesn't look like it came from you. A good example of this, one of the new attorneys had at some point was like on a television show and they were talking about the gun evidence. And he was like, yeah, that's pretty good evidence. You know, you, you get the markings and all this other stuff. Right. So of course, as soon as he was appointed, that gets pushed out, you know, it gets pushed out. You see it on Twitter. You see it everywhere. People are like, how can you represent him as if that's evidence, right? Like they can't, they're not going to play that in Richard Allen's trial. He'll just change his mind once he's reviewed the evidence. Right. But you just see sort of a lot of that stuff. You're seeing that with Judge Gull. You're seeing that with sort of the way her opinions are being pushed out and, and she's being made to appear to be biased against defense attorneys. It's a fascinating thing. I mean, just sitting back and watching it, I would not want to be in this case. The, the prosecution is sort of fortunate that they're kind of sitting back, but they know that this whole circus is not good for them. The last thing they want is for this to continue um, look, I think tomorrow's hearing will be interesting. What will be really interesting is if it's just completely uneventful, because once again, we talk about this case all the time. You follow this case religiously. We're all on Twitter. We're all on the Facebook. You know, we're like doing all this stuff. It may be that judge goal doesn't care about any of this. <laughs> like she may just walk in and be like, I don't care about any of that stuff. We're just going to have the standard hearing that we were going to have. This is essentially an arraignment with new attorneys and just move forward and not even mention it. I mean, that's a possibility. And, and we'll just have to see. Like, just because they're making a lot of noise doesn't mean that anyone in the court is actually paying attention to it. And yeah, I think Mallory's asking about, I think there are so many lessons. Like I said, we did that training for law enforcement. We pointed to this case and, and the mistakes that have been made, particularly in the secrecy, as things not to do. And, and the consequences if you do it. And I feel like... Everybody needs to be paying attention to this. And, and the mandamus petition does a really good job of saying, like, look, this is a really big case and everybody's watching it. It's an important to everybody in Indiana. And that's another reason we need to have the public. Look, look I, I didn't I didn't mind. I thought the mandamus petition was really well done. I didn't love the fact that they released all those documents and didn't redact anything. I thought that was just yet another sort of, you know, <laughs> attempt to get around the court's orders 
to have another press release, essentially. They got their 132-page memorandum is back out there in the new filing. It's just sort of, you know, what are you going to do? These guys, they're they're pretty good. They're pretty good at what they do. I mean, I tip my hat to their ability to manipulate the media. They've done an excellent job of it so far. Okay. Well, somehow I've managed to talk for 50 minutes. I don't know how that happened. Like... Like I said, normally I have Alice. I haven't even, but I haven't even had an opportunity to like take a drink of my beer or my or my Topo Chico. I'm not even sure which one I want more. I'm gonna go with the Topo Chico. So what's up? Other than that, I got nothing. What's everybody dressing up for? Is uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Halloween. My kids are going as astronauts, and so my wife and I are going to be NASA control. So that'll be fun. Question, could there be any other end game? The prosecution has to get Baldwin Rossi removed, and they saw this as an opt to do so. Could possibly be that they're trying this case in the media. I mean, is the prosecution trying the case in the media? I don't think so at this point. I think, look, it would surprise me if the prosecution liked those two. <laughs> I'll grant you that. And, and as I said, you know, Bob and I were talking about this yesterday. A judge may hate these two guys, but they gave her the ammunition. Like they essentially were like, here, here's a knife, stab us in the back, right? Here, here is a perfectly legitimate reason to remove us. The first time I was asked about this, what are the possible sanctions? One of the things I said was that they could be removed from the case because you can be. I mean, they violated a protective order. You know, they, they, they acted with gross negligence. They, they, it's not great. It was the second leak that came from them. The first one, like I said, was relatively minor, but nevertheless, how, how many times do you have to be told to do, not do something like this? And they did. And so at that point, I just, I, I think about this case and I often think about cases in through the lens of appeals. So there, there are multiple ways to think about something. And in one way is like, just like, what is just right. And, and what is best for the defendant or what is best for the case? And I totally get looking at a case like that. I totally get that. But the thing is judges have a lot of discretion to do a lot of things, a lot of things you don't agree with, a lot of things you disagree with, but they have that discretion and it only becomes a problem for sort of the foundations of the case if they abuse that discretion. So when these guys did what they did, particularly Baldwin. I mean, maybe Rosie has an argument. You know, maybe he's completely innocent. I don't know. But particularly Baldwin, when they did what they did, they made it such that it would be very easy for a court in the future to say the judge did not abuse their discretion when she removed lawyers who had, mal not, or not maliciously, but through gross negligence, violated a protective order and leaked sensitive information to the public that was supposed to stay private, right? I mean, it's just, it's easy for a court to write that opinion. So that's how I tend to look at it. and. You know, I just, it's hard for me. They may, maybe eventually they'll succeed in getting rid of her, but it's hard for me to imagine that they somehow managed to get back into it. Like, I don't necessarily think that some new judge would come in and say, well, you know, I really disagree with how the judge handled that to such an extent that I'm now going to reverse that order and I'm going to reappoint these two attorneys. I just, I just don't, I don't see how, how that can happen. So I guess we'll see. But you guys are awesome. This has been fun. Can't believe we've been here for 53 minutes. Um, but hey, that's this case. And I feel like every couple days we're going to be discussing this. Legal briefs is basically just turning into Delphi discussions. So whatever. Okay, guys. I hope everybody has a happy Halloween. Next time it'll be both me and... Alice. I know y'all are all very excited. We're going to try and record later this week. So if you're a patron, we're going to do something else as well. But y'all are awesome. Love you guys. Mean it. And until next time, I'm Brett. Hope Alice is somewhere being awesome. And I'm at least one prosecutor. Bye, guys.